So welcome to the Design History Society Symposium, Designing the Domestic Innovation in the Home. I'm Alex Bannister. I'm one of the Society's ambassadors and I'm the organiser of the symposium today, an event which aims to highlight innovative design throughout history and to consider how we sh shape objects and spaces and how they shape us in return in our domestic environments. Our call for papers welcome proposals from a diverse range of speakers at all stages of their academic careers, covering a broad spectrum of design disciplines from across the world. And the result is a very varied and rich symposium that hopefully will lead to some exciting discussion. It will be divided into two parts, spaces and objects, um, with a short break in between. And before we begin, please just make sure that your microphone is on mute for you out the papers. And if you have any questions, please just pop them in the chat and we'll address them at uh, a group Q&A at the end of each session. Um, so to begin, we have Barbara Fonseca. Barbara is a Portuguese born architect based currently in Barcelona. She holds a master's in architecture from the Technical Institute in Lisbon and her research looks at home, habitability, and human relations. So I'll pass over to Barbara now. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, and and so we're going to we're going to start. Um, so throughout the ages, we've witnessed profound changes, mainly in the way we see ourselves, how we relate to others, and how we inhabit space. And now in the 21st century, these changes felt exponentially. We're constantly faced with challenges in terms of how we conceive the home as a basic cell, an expression of our personality and the place to live our, our, our daily lives. So this idea of complexity inherent to the individual, to the house and to the relationships we establish and build through it draws us to the relationship of unknowledgement towards the people who live with us and towards our own interiority as we inhabit our different houses. The floor plan arises here as the main element of analysis, as the design object. Uh, there is a fundamental place that is both a starting point and a finishing point, the house. And as a human system, the house is the nodal point because it represents the symbiosis of all cultural phenomena in the same space. We set off this journey precisely from the house and the idea of dwelling, from the relationship between the body and space, since you recognize the act of dwelling as an inner experience from within one's own being. We explore how the key concepts, living from the center and house of many rooms, have evolved in relation to the physical and spatial form of the house and how significant they are as a clue to solutions that respond to our time. In one of Louis Kahn's uh, sketches, we read that architecture comes from the making of a room and that the room is the place of the mind, taking us back to the oniric image of the house. Through this provocation and explorations portrayed in arts, the media and the human study, we explore the idea of the room and the floor plan as a society of rooms. So starting from the floor plan of a house in Ur in prehistoric Mesopotamia, we see that the central space has been at the core of the house since the earliest civilizations. The floor plan is characterized by a series of rooms arranged around this central courtyard, an open air meeting space that fosters different enc encounters between those who inhabited these settlements. These spatial concepts seem to have ar arisen from instinctive solutions on how to group spaces and people at a time when the main concern was the protection of the populations that began to settle and inhabit this common entity, the city. In the 16th century, the floor plan of um, Raphael's Villa Madama incorporates features that represent what was a common practice at the time. Once inside the house and from the central space, it is necessary to move from one room to the next and so on, and the floor plan appears as a labyrinth of rooms permeable to the numerous members of the family that at this time was characterized as having a deeply rooted relationship within the community. At the same time in Italy, uh, the interaction of characters in space became to them began to dominate painting and the Madonna dell'Impanata emerges as a leading exa example of this. Uh, still in the 16th century, Andrea Palladio contributed to the establishment of a model that validated the house as a set of interconnected rooms. Villa Foscari is one of the examples where, is it, possible, where it is possible to identify the central space or room that allowed a multiplicity of uses and functions adaptable to different circumstances. Also, the absence of a qualitative distinction between the room where I remain and stay or the room that I simply pass through. 
going on to the 17th century, um, the family within the family there was a growing emphasis on autonomy and on the individual rights and the independent passage appears in the configuration of the house as the beginning of a more accentuated separation between the servant and the served so this approach is evident here in Amesbury house where there is a certain risk of the self in the presence of the other a stranger to the more restricted family and the independent passage mediates the entry into the house and regulates the access to the different spaces even so, we understand that the gathering uh, character and the taste for company are recognized and the larger central space and the interconnected rooms represent just that. Jumping off to the 19th century, um, this century brought what can be considered the greatest systemization of access. Even so, here in the Lincoln Zinfields example, it stands out because um, I mean, in what concerns the journey through the house and the question of integration and separation of the domestic space. Uh, in this example, as a room closes, the aesthetics of the space unfolds and the house becomes a labyrinth at every turn. This dialectic between interior and exterior of the domestic space is explored in a comparison with the work of the painter Johann Edmund Hummel, The Burning Room, uh, in which the boundaries of the room acquire an ambiguous character by the positioning or careful positioning of the mirrors and reflections. Still in the 19th century, the corridor came to specialize the house in a paradox. It was able to bring the most dis distant rooms closer together, but by separating those that were closest. At the same time, it facilitated communication, it reduced contact. And the red house is the exponent of this century's approach with rooms that never connect, never have more than one door and configure the circulation space into a totally distinct distinct and independent unit. So this reflects a society in which the private sphere of the family and the individual has been carefully delimited and the personal preferences were highly valued. This is precisely what, for example, this painting of La Belle Isol represent, uh, characterizes. Instead of the interwining of bodies that we saw in Raphael's Madonna, there are now personal objects, furniture, curtains, accessories and ornaments that capture our attention and symbolize life itself. So from the first half of the 20th century, we can recognize that the functional, uh, functionalist approaches came to specialize the rooms, give them specific dimensions and adapt them to exclusive, exclusive operations, such as sleeping, eating or cooking and elevating the home to a use without what was considered friction at the time. We can talk about the controversy over the farmer's house uh, that illustrates precisely this bringing us back this paradox of flexibility. So Ms. van der Hoe's client felt that the house, apparently flexible due to its free floor plan and openness to the outside, did not adapt to her needs, routines or daily habits. It could almost be admitted that there was an attempt to avoid or eliminate the oniric image of the house, distan distancing it from its complex condition. Uh, Jacques Tati's Monanco um, movie satirizes precisely this aspect of modernity with excessive specialization and rationalization that results in a sort of loss of uh, everyday freedoms. So although the functionalist floor plan dominated the 20th century, there are projects and approaches that challenge and offer an alternative to functionalist logics. At their root is this desire to explore and achieve greater, greater cultural significance by increasing the spatial opportunities of the house plan. So for example, Francesc Mitchen's Zoller House or Roger Dina's Amherstrasse Apartments or even Peter Markley's Sargon's Building are three examples in which the search for these existential meanings are, is recognized, making them capable of endure over time. Um, when we arrive to the 21st century, we have this example of uh, housing leads from Irish Mateus that reflects the idea that Architecture is real phenomenal, and a phenomenological experience. In the, these infinite spaces of the housing village, which is a, a house of many rooms, the architects explore the clarity of the structure and the quality and comprehensibility of spaces. They ensure new and different uses at any moment, promoting and not restricting freedom. This idea is also related to the theory of Aldo Rossi, who argues that architecture is all the more significant, the more its form can contain various functions over time. Although, although typologically different from uh, the housing in Lidish, Sergio Sanzbe's, 
Sergi Bates mansion block project or even the uh, E2A residential building uh, in Berlin organized several apartments, each of which follows a logic of spatial equivalence through a set of interconnected rooms. So the main objective of these organizations of domestic interior space is to establish an infrastructural grid materialized as something permanent and definer of clear boundaries um, with options that tend to privilege the user wherever their context, circumstances or needs and however often they change and, and develop. Uh, we have even two more examples, for example, the, the Arc Plus magazine space and, uh, and Jack Self's mean home project uh, that end up resulting uh, in clear and objective floor plans that don't hinder future uses, but are extremely adaptable. Design and provoke indeterminacy, resulting in the non-impediment of, of appropriation. So this idea is directly related to the position that both Manuel Ajmateus Mateus and Bob Van Rees defend that all designs should be timely and timeless, appropriate to their time and simultaneously designed for future times. So basically, it's interesting that the, the complexity involved in exploring these issues led us to realize that the floor plan and its reconfiguration in the 21st century is based on the combination of multiple factors that are changing at remarkable paces. New family forms are now emerging and are successively more moving away from the traditional nuclear family. Issues such as the family itself, gender roles, sexuality, personal identity, and interaction with others are now constantly changing with obvious effects on the redesign and organization of spaces. So a new individualism is emerging, which based on the transitoriness of human relationships is linked to a daily reality built on collectivity and the constant mutability of circumstances. The question of how we live together is on the daily agenda, leading to deep reflections based on the fact that spaces shape our behavior and are constantly transformed by our use. The spaces we inhabit sort of choreograph relationships between strangers, couples and families in a world where the taste for collectiveness and for sharing is also built through intimate moments and being with ourselves. So the way in which the layout of the house transforms and adapts to social change is the key to its survival as an element that has the capacity to increasingly allow and incorporate the changing nature of circumstances. The house designed around these two key concepts that we identified can adapt to contemporary ways of life and to the needs of any time. It represents a place of freedom precisely for questioning and incorporating the characteristics of each time for configuring itself as more durable, adaptable, multicultural and intergenerational for responding and corresponding to life itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for starting us off. Um, our next speakers are from the Faculty of Design Science at the University of Antwerp. Celine Gerenks is an interior architect and doctoral researcher whose research focuses on the bodily and mental effects of modern housing ideologies. And Els de Vos is associate professor and chair of the interior architecture program at the University of Antwerp, whose research is situated in the field of history and theory of interior architecture, home culture, gender and public space in the second half of the 20th century. And today they will be discussing kitchen design, body movements and household reform. Okay, thank you. I will share my screen. Okay, you can see everything. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for having us here. Um, the image of this opening slide shows, in fact, Dutch designer Piet Zwart making gym exercises in front of a large window with an open view towards countryside. It concerns a photo shoot that he organized himself to prepare promotional images for the layout of a manual called Domestic Indoor Gymnastics for All, authored in 1930 by Hubert Bleyenberg, a doctor in physical education. Um, is it going to the next slide or not? I don't see it moving. No, it isn't. Uh, no? No. It's not moving. Now, okay. Yes. 
Okay, interestingly, uh, Pizzuart is also associated with the iconic Brazil kitchen that was launched on the Dutch market in 1938. An original copy of the kitchen is currently on display at the Kunstmuseum in Den Haag. As such, we, hear, um, we see here a designer who fills two different roles. Before uh, going deeper into these roles, we first wonder what home gymnastics and kitchen design have in common, and to what extent home gymnastics was present in the kitchen design. We know that both share healthy body movement, improving living and also home standards. Actually, in that sense, it's about body movement, ergonomics and home economics. When it comes to the design of the Brazil kitchen, it is remarkable that design plans for a Brazil kitchen are already made in 1936 by Dutch architect Kuhn Limberg. In addition, the archive material shows that Kuhn Limberg had already done a lot of preliminary research, kitchen research. In January of uh, 1936, Limberg was apparently in contact with Brunsil, a flourishing carpentry factory in wooden floors, doors and floors, to negotiate a contract for mass producing kitchens. What is the role of Kuhn Limberg on the one hand and Pizzuart on the other hand? We will shed light on both in the Brunsil kitchen narrative. Next, how do ergonomics, exercise, and home economics fit into that narrative? Um, as for Kuhn Limberg, with a degree in civil architecture, he had an analytical mind for denouncing the social ills of the time. Among others, in his publication Kitchens, he focuses on the bad practices. He co-authored a publication with cooking teacher and nutrition specialist, Ms. Lothering Hillebrand, who he met at a study day on the topic of efficiency. The architect's commitment to the social uh, socialist development from the field of design can be explained by his origins. His grandfather, a draftsman and engineer, and his father was Professor Theodor Limberg, an acclaimed uh, professor in business economics, who was in the board of the Dutch Institute for Efficiency that later joined the Dutch Organization for Housewives. He focused on the issue of the family household and would involve his son Kuhn in this matter. Besides extensive information on kitchens uh, references in several types of transport, such as trains, boats, planes, and at the end also um, design advice with extensive inventory of kitchen utilities with, with its dimensions, Limberg shares his approval of the standardized cubic kitchen designed by Belgian architect Louis Herman de Koning, what Limberg considered as a um, CM example but also the all-electric kitchen presented at the Ideal Home Exhibition in 1934, he valued highly. We will explain in the following slides what both cases would become, um, that both cases would become a leading threat in this design for the Brunsdale kitchen. During a contractual two-phase design process taking place in 1936, Limberg uh, first started with drawing up uh, single cabinets and organized the content of their kitchen inventory over the different cabinets elements. We notice here similarities with the Quebec kitchen, which is to be explained as the duo um, paid a small commission to the CM for using their information. The cooperation with Brazil eventually, eventually finished by the end of the summer in 1936, as all contractual tasks were fulfilled, but the communication between them, however less frequent, remained until the launch of the kitchen, which Limberg initially demanded not to be more than one year after sealing the contract. From Limberg's administration, we also learned that he organized for Brunsdale and himself, right in the beginning of the contract, a study trip to London to visit kitchen examples and to have interviews with specialists. In the second phase, Limberg and his associate drew a floor plan with, with the organization of materials and requisites. In this organization, we see similar uh, similarities with the all-electric kitchen. It uh, regards as well as the, it regards here also the design of the architect Osborne, uh, together with the Dutch uh, Ms. Versteeg. Probably she was the president, president of the Women Electricity Organization in Utrecht, the city where Limberg graduated. The location of the cooking stove and the dishwashing sink are in the same location. Only the passing box and the sink are switched. Uh, in overall, it regards a spacious room, and it was meant for a house, household with one servant who could serve as such um, as a sitting room in the home. Fascinating is the scenography proposal, as you can see on the left. So it's uh, on this side here. Yeah. Uh, by, Limberg, uh, by Limberg to construct a window frame with wood and painted paper that gives an outside perspective to the countryside. But the, however, the window was not present in the building. 
Uh, Lemberg was very familiar with scenography. As you can see here, uh, he realized uh, an, um, um, several decor sets on their first locations or situations, such as theater, dance, but also exhibitions for fairs and even retail. In addition, he designed theater and dance costumes. On the other hand, so the versatile designer Piet Zwart from his side was involved in a few sports related design assignments. The aforementioned book on home gymnastics is a manual with descriptions of body exercises, sketches, and 10 large class posters. With photography, a progressive medium at the time, Zwart considered apt for documenting the daily life, he experimented to create a visual layout that communi communicates a rather classic training of body exercises to a more progressive audience. A second assignment was the design of the Brazil sailing boat, uh, equipped for long-term competition races. The Sea Eagle was used in 1936 to sail from New York to Germany. In an article, uh, Zwart explains that he saw this as the ultimate uh, opportunity to get rid of a traditional thought in boat interiors, boat interiors. He wanted to adapt the interior to the needs of sailors' work by applying the modern movement philosophy and their furniture had to be flexible to respond to the waves of the sea and provide support uh, such as uh, steel pillars. The seat of the navigation space consisted creatively for bike settles. Um, the in the archives, we saw that Swart came with plans in a later stage of the process, uh, so by the autumn of 1936. We noticed that Swart focused on more, more on the detailing of specific cooking tasks and the practical organization of cabinet interiors, something that he learned to be important during the sailboat assignment. In his visual presentation of cabinets, are, uh, uh, the cabinets are composed in lines uh, similar to the Holland kitchen of architect uh, Janssen proposed in 1929. But the kitchen elements uh, remind of Limbert's design that was based on the Belgian uh, Quebec kitchen. Here we see also that uh, the scenographic window has disappeared. Although it was not visibly traceable, how Zwart composed the, uh, composed the proposed uh, kitchen floor plans based on ergonomic body movement, in his archive we found documents in which he restructures inventories gathered from the Dutch Women Association for Housewives and the Institute of Efficiency. Similar to the publication on home gymnastics, in the commercial folders he applies the method of photography to draw and compose illustrations that visually communicate how to use the kitchen and what specific household tasks can be carried out. Uh, the result is that the final Brazil kitchen was launched in uh, 1938 and it was approved by the Dutch Women Organization for Housewives. They integrated the kitchen in their cooking demonstrations, for example, as you can see here at the Siemen House in Den Haag. So when we uh, come uh, to the, the conclusions, um, I see it's reflection, but it should be conclusions. Uh, so on the role of the boat designers, uh, for Kuhn Limberg, um, he built its international and national relations with home economics experts and architects. He took care of the technical preliminary research, and he approached the kitchen spatially by applying scenographic qualities such as the trompe l'oeil. Uh, as a matter for um, Piet Zwart, he found you technical design uh, based on organization of the cabinets, internal organization and extension, made an extension of cabinet tools for specific household tasks. He took care of a clear visual presentation for the client brochures and folders, and he followed the modernist thought uh, of rationalizing functionality uh, and authenticity in design. Um, then finally, for the body movement and ergonomics, um, clear user scripts uh, or accompanying um, calculations are not present in Zwart's archives about the kitchen. And uh, in contrast to his drawings for um, for the home gymnastics uh, and the brown seals uh, sailboat. But there's also, an, we see there's an affinity uh, between the indoor body movements and the use of the kitchen. So our final conclusion is that the kitchen was created through the efforts of two versatile designers with skills in ergonomics, um, home economics, furniture design, scenography, and body exercise, in short, with talented interior design skills. Thank you.
Thank you both. Um, just a reminder that if anyone has any questions for our speakers, please do pop them in the chat and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the, uh, the session. Um, our next speaker is Priya Gupta. Priya is a PhD scholar at the Faculty of Architecture at CEPT Ahmedabad. Her research interests encompass modernism in India, South Asian urbanism and revisionist histories of everyday urban life. And today she'll be discussing the shaping of the modern domestic in India. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'll just start uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, is this visible? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I have chosen uh, Jalis of Chandigarh, India as a design object whose genesis uh, influence on housing and diminished values uh, in the last uh, 70 years highlight how it shaped uh, residents' lifestyles. Jalis were traditionally in stone or wood. The traditional Jali that you see here is Siddhi Saidi Mosque in Ahmedabad from 1571. What is known of Jalis uh, percolating um, into the Indian subcontinent was with the advent of Mughals. They are known to have intricate Jali patterns. It is said to have theological underpinnings and has a strong relation to light and to shadow patterns. Jalis break down the total square meter expanse of opening into a number of perforations that are usually smaller than the thickness of the material it is built in. So this reduces the ingress of direct sunlight and glare during the day. It also allows everything to be visible from the inside, but not the vice versa. Uh, and hence it was best suited to the notions of privacy in Indian subcontinent, specifically when it came to gender. Uh, the patterns shown here uh, are in Raja Birbal's house in Fatapur Sikri. Shifting from the historical underpinning of the traditional Jali, I will be talking about this lattice screen, if I may call it modernistically in brick. Uh, the imagination of Jalis and Chandigarh primarily comprised brick lattice screens in both government and private houses. Uh, the Jalis here uh, interpret uh, social customs through modern means and language. This design object in a way uh, incorporated the need for privacy and ventilation from modern cost-effective material, the brick. And brick is then the motif that repeats to produce shadow patterns of modernism in straight lines and proportions true to its construction. The Jalis were uh, Initially conceptualized for government houses, uh, Chandigarh's housing is known for its modern architecture program and aesthetics, devised by the team of Pierre Jean Ray, Maxwell Fry, and Jean Drew. The houses built were attempting to address issues of cost, climate, and culture. The houses that you see uh, right now on the left are both government houses. The one on the left is Pierre Jean Ray's house himself. Um, this is the plan of one of the government houses as an example. Uh, the jalis and domestic spaces were mainly attached to verandas. It was a semi-enclosed uh, outdoor space in homes, accounting for a domestic culture of outdoor sleeping and having any outdoor activities. Uh, here is the veranda space from the inside in an enclosed uh, brick jali on one side. And you also see on the right side is a photo, is an old photo from the archives of CCA Montreal that shows these lightweight beds on both the sides, uh, which were called manjas uh, in, in Punjab. And uh, they were kept for outdoor sleeping. Priya, oh, sorry Priya. to interrupt. Are you able to change your presentation to um, just the, because we can see both your slides, you can, we can see your notes as well. Yeah. Are you able to uh, change it to presenter mode? Yeah, uh, okay, so should I uh, just, should I stop sharing once? Yeah. And maybe try again, yeah. Yeah. We, okay. Yeah, we can see like the next slide and your notes as well. So it'd be good to see the, just the main slide in big, more detail. Uh, okay, I sorry about it. that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, just give me a second. Right, so I'll just shift, um, yeah. 
Uh, the overall architecture of the city drew from Corbusier's principles of sun, space, and verdure, um, and hence mainly uh, the architectural uh, elements that emerged uh, were as shading devices. Brisolet being one of uh, Corbusier's key features, uh, uh, and the Jalis being an interpretation of that Brisolet in brick. The Chandigarh style became a popular term that could be described as exposed brick, whitewashed bands, and cantilevers. Um, is it moving? Yeah. The Jalis percolated from the government houses to the private houses through development controls, which were both volumetric and aesthetic regulations. For row houses, private row houses, architecture controls and frame controls were applicable for the development of first two phases of the city. Uh, houses regulated uh, were regulated to ensure a collective urban identity. The photos one, two, three on the top that you see are uh, houses under architecture control in phase one. The bottom photo that you see are houses under uh, frame control in phase two. Both have different urban forms. However, the commonality is the presence of jalis. Uh, talking about the architecture control, different architecture controls were prevalent for different sectors in phase one, uh, but the jalis on the rear were common in all controls. And interestingly, they were located strategically on the top floor of all the houses, which was the top floor was added as a request uh, by the residents. However, they were the top floor was regulated with respect to its height, with respect to its built up area, and of course, the inclusion of jalis. Uh, the Jalis ensured uh, ventilation and visual buffer was behind because most of these row houses were either back-to-back -back modules or had a small uh, narrow service lane in between uh, the back-to-back -back houses. Uh, the specific pattern stipulated in architecture controls uses brick tiles that were one and a half inch thick. Um, one course would have vertical brick tiles uh, and above that uh, would be horizontal brick tiles supported by the vertical brick tiles. This is actually a stipulated drawing uh, that I've taken out from the archives on the Chandigarh planning uh, website. Uh, two more controls I found specifically, one of them being V-shaped jali patterns in brick and another one being simple uh, brick courses with a gap of four and a half inches between the bricks. Uh, shifting to the frame control of phase two of the city, here the domestic built form also changed and here each floor now had terraces for outdoor use and hence each terrace had brick jollies. Here one sees plain patterns at a much larger scale uh, along sector dividing roads of the city. And of course the brick patterns. Uh, uh, to uh, over here, the drawing on the left was the suggested brick patterns in the frame control. Um, however, uh, varying brick patterns have emerged uh, over a period of time after having done an architectural survey. Uh, one realizes that uh, there was relaxation in the patterns in uh, the brick jallies that were allowed. Uh, some of the residents I had interviewed uh, who had the terraces and the jollies, uh, they told that terraces were the most vital spaces for their domestic use, for sitting together for meals, for snacks, uh, especially during pleasant weather, or sitting and soaking in the sun in winters. Or on a daily basis, these uh, spaces would allow spilling out domestic activities, especially washing and drying of clothes, and storing of other household technologies like tanks or uh, coolers. Uh, so this design innovation, the Jali, uh, amalgamated the need for visual privacy, uh, cut the harsh sun, ensured ventilation, and created a cheaper, quicker, and integral decorative element in varying permutations of brick. Hence, uh, the Jali was not just a design object for the interior of the uh, Indian home, but as I said, uh, it was a regulated object, which was creating an aesthetic play in the, uh, in the street picture. Uh, besides being regulated, they became a popular means of ornamentation and function as well, even where there were no uh, specified aesthetic regulations. These are the fronts of houses where or staircase cores were located and there were different varying 
uh, brick patterns and brick jollies uh, there. Or they were visible as Claire Story. Uh, they were there for Claire Story openings. And probably what you see on the left is uh, they probably were taking cues from the images on the left, which were uh, Jali patterns prescribed for architecture controls for uh, commercial buildings. Just a few more uh, of these houses having these patterns. Um, they were also present on the side facades of private houses for additional uh, ventilation of the terraces. Hence, a Jali becomes a chosen element within the modern domestic vocabulary of Chandigarh, especially in the initial phases of the construction of the city. Uh, it was enabled by regulations, cost effectivity, and climate responsiveness. However, this is what is happening today. Uh, with time, especially in phase two of the city, these jalis are losing importance and visual charm to the increasing need of additional covered areas on each floor, uh, with, of course, the changing needs of 21st century. This has been facilitated by the relaxations in the development controls and, of course, uh, new technologies and especially the air conditioning. If we take the cross section of the back to back uh, character of these row houses, especially in phase two, what you see was initially these step terraces and screens like the Jalis, uh, ensuring access to ventilation, light, and privacy. However, uh, the relaxations have increased the proximity and reduced the distance between two houses. That means the neighbors could be more closer to each other in a way. And the balconies at the back, which are protruding, uh, have exposed the houses uh, to the interior domesticity. Uh, the privateness of domesticity is vanishing from the street picture as well. Um, and in certain unfortunate cases, it's like this one, um, the center house is sort of engulfed by both sides by the renovated houses, which have reduced the access to the sun space and verdure. When we look at it from the inside, uh, this one begins to question the design history of the Jali, which is at the verge of losing its value uh, from the domestic realm, um, from the regulated urban forms of the Chandigar style. It was a departure from the play of brick for privacy uh, to the protrusion of urban forms, but also a departure from access to sun space and verdure with the neighboring domesticities encroaching upon its right. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, our final paper in the Spaces session looks at domesticity and housing on Airbnb and will be given by Paloma Caragnani and Gabriella Gugliotella. Paloma is a master's degree candidate in urban studies and housing in Latin America at the facility at the sorry faculty of architecture design and urbanism at the University of Buenos Aires. Gabriella is professor of art and design in gender studies and art history and I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Hi and good morning. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Our presentation is called Billboard Space, Domesticity and Housing on Airbnb. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Gabriela Guglielotela, Professor of Arts at the University of, of Buenos Aires. And in, I'm here with my co-worker, Paloma Carignani, a master's degree candidate in urban studies and housing in Latin American uh, Faculty of Architecture, Design and Urbanism on the, at the University of Buenos Aires. We are interested in analyzing the relationship between housing, decoration, and domesticity from the advertisements, photographs, and objects of the temporary rental platform in Buenos Aires, Airbnb. In public order interactions in social media, norms are established and rules are discussed for the construction of meaning about housing. The relevance of studying the meanings that circulate in social networks is sustained by the impact that this construction may have on the design processes of housing production and the social meanings are derived from there. So we want to ask uh, what operations in the file of architecture and design shape the standard of on the dominant meanings, senses of, of domestic, which operations are presented 
as guarantee of destruction. What we are interested in highlighting in this presentation is how the contribution of feminist theories uh, contribute to dismantling uh, these senses and these meanings. This is one of uh, these theories. So we use this um, installation here yeah, um, about floating modernity. The, this work is a work that was promoted after the International Cambridge Analytica scandal. He announced the collapse of the institution of modernity with his uh, house, the Le Corbusier Bilsawa house, in his installation. It was uh, called uh, by Barbara as Functionalism, that is modern movement. The theories of postmodernists and feminists will be the ones who show how the same concepts that are used in the universalistic logic of design are those of the social contract that they organize in a binary way. There is a direct link between the categories of modernity, neutrality, and functionality that are presented in Airbnb publications. Modern architecture and design become part of the collective imagination in the representation of women's magazines, decorations, magazines, films, newspaper, among others. Since then, photos of home interiors have circulated, becoming a topic of research. Uh, Teresa de Laurentiis, based on Foucault's works, presents architecture as a gender technology, capable of shaping bodies and ways of living. These are the contributions that allows us to depend uh, the discussion of Airbnb+. Plus. This is one of the main sectors of Preciel's work about Pornotopia, and it's about uh, Playboy magazine. And this is one of the, the recent uh, news about Airbnb and how the company uses the, the news for um, being constantly uh, in our mouth. So the second question we want to present to you is what do spaces are like on uh, Airbnb? How the company builds the legitimacy? Uh, what is the point of constructing an idea of domesticity? in the platform. Since its born in uh, 2008, the digitally temporary rental platform called Area B has been widely studied from the role in the cities. The narratives of the platform will be analyzed in this work, understanding that this type of changing occur within the concept of expandation of what we call a uh, platform capitalism. That is the media system uh, whose conglomerate of digital platforms records our behavioral patterns uh, around the world every day. Airbnb Plus respond to the catalog of suggestions from decoration experts and pictures taken by the company professional photographers. Airbnb Plus guarantees the quality of design of the apartment to be temporarily rented detailing the qualities associated with good design. The company chooses the term design to refer to the interior decoration of homes. They actively participate in digital publication of disciplinary interest with news that highlights their interest in design and the experiences of like living like a local. These are publications of the same guest, the publications of the same guest, the objective of selecting the picture proposes something more, more ambitious than describing the special qualities of the, set, of the home offered. The picture galleries allow the viewing of good, good taste decoration that has a clear relationship with the selection of objects, arrangement in space, and practices linked to them. Rachel Harry, the responsible for the interior design of the Airbnb office, Airbnb offices, it says, the company has begun to shape the future of how we live and how we work. Our principles consist of creating spaces that feel comfortable, pleasant, domestic, and when we are lucky, that unite uh, and transform user, users. I see design as a vehicle to create trust and ultimate the necessary sense of belonging 
for guests to step into the unknown everywhere, anywhere. This was uh, Rachel Hervey's uh, words. In last, uh, they introduced in the last uh, mail, uh, the company introduced Airbnb categories, a new way to for the guests to discover places to stay. Here we show one. Um, the house of Frank Lord Wright was uh, in the design tag. I don't know what you can see. It. So we are going to, to present some categories linked with good design that consol consolidate the dominant binary and essentialist meanings and senses. And as the result proposal by Flesler and Duran indicate exclusions. Airbnb Plus, in its role of educating users, justifies and legitimize sorry, these dominant senses about the field of housing production. Its user replicates, in turn, the selection and consecration uh, of the content of the architecture canon. As an example, during the pandemic, uh, which forced Airbnb to rethink the relationship uh, between its user, the way of being in contact with the users changed and deserves a special mention in, in this work. Every registered user received uh, from the company the possibility of uh, downloading, uh, downloading sorry, picture of homes to use in the background in, in the calls like this. And that had been massively popular in the, in the recent year, you know. Here we can see how Airbnb uses the, the architecture to legitimize themselves. The experiences of living in an Airbnb plus is shaping by the company. From the first contact uh, with the listening, listening, sorry, long before living in the apartment. This is one of the canon example. And you have another one in America Latina. So to conclude, um, just as modern state institutions were studied during the previous century, it is worth asking about the role of software development companies nowadays. Airbnb is formed as a domestic technology that indicates ways of behaving and valuing spaces and impacts the habits of consumers, inhabitants, and planners, modifying interests. The discursivity about the ideal home has found in Airbnb a new space from the reproduction of nominant senses. This is one of our last pictures, so we are glad to, to be with you and we hope to, to listen to our questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>